Hello everybody, welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to talk about designing a Pinterest layout. Some people may call Pinterest layout masonry layout. It is essentially a grid layout and works by placing elements in optimal position based on the available vertical space. Pinterest layout usually uses fixed width columns. Let's say there are three columns on a 900 pixel screen. Each column has a fixed width. And let's suppose we are placing nine pictures with various heights in this order. If you look at picture number four closely, it is placed at the second column that has the shortest height. There are some other requirements including, first of all, images should be rendered into fixed width columns. Second of all, we want to preserve the aspect ratio of the image. And we want to provide image of different size for different viewport. We will show how to do this in the API overview. Third of all, we should consider adding infinite scroll which fits very well for entertainment type content. Other things we should consider to include in our design is images should be responsive across different screen size. We should consider loading lower resolution images for a smaller screen. And lastly, we want to make sure we have fast images downloading and smooth rendering of these images. So we went over the requirements Next, I'd like to come up with a basic design, discuss the API request and response, and talk about some optimizations that we should be aware of. In the beginning, let's see how we can position the images on the screen. What we can do is to maintain an array of columns heights. The array would have n elements, where n is the number of columns. And then we could figure out the shortest column, then insert a new entry to the column heights array then update the style of the pin. The image is absolute positioned. This is to help avoid triggering the reflow. And what should happen when the screen resizes? So when screen resizes, we will have to recompute, layout, and render again. Basically, we can have a couple of breakpoints in our CSS. And once the screen size goes over the breakpoints, we will trigger the callback to compute and lay out the images on the screen. Next, let's look at the API request and response. The request is pretty straightforward. We have a get request with an optional parameter taking the previous cursor. The cursor remembers the place where we left off in the previous request. This previous four string is usually converted to base64. So here I just wanted to show you the raw string for demo purpose. Inside the response, we would have some metadata indicating how many images there are in total, how many we have fetched. The page info object includes the information about where to start fetching for the next request and how many images to fetch. The data array consists of the images or video information we needed to display on the screen. You can pause the video and take a close look at it, but here I want to call out the images property. For each pin, it contains an images property one image would be shown for a specific viewport width. Then we could use these along with the current viewport width to give priority hints to browsers to determine which images should be loaded first and which could be lazy loaded. One problem with the image tag is that it takes up zero space until the browser loads enough of the image to know the dimension. If we don't do anything about it, you would see the layout shift constantly as images finishes loading and the images on top keeps pushing the images below further down the screen. One way to resolve this is to give the tag a width and a height and define the aspect ratio of the image. It looks something like this. We specify the aspect ratio, we give it a width, and then we specify the object fit. Object fit cover makes sure that the image is sized to maintain its aspect ratio while filling the element's entire content box. According to MDN, for the average website, 51% of its bandwidth comes from imagery, followed by video at 25%, so it is safe to say it's very important to address and optimize your multimedia content. So here we want to talk about the optimizations. First of all, how are we going to download all the images? We should consider first loading images above the fold. Above the fold for a website refers to the content a viewer sees before they scroll down. 
and when the ping is an image carousel, we could give the priority hint to the image tag and decide which one to load first by adding an importance attribute. For example, for image carousel ping, we will load the first image and lazy load the rest. We should consider upgrading the picture and source element with media and or size attributes. The next optimizations are that we lazy load images that are below the fold or are for different viewport sizes. We can specify the loading attribute on the image tag if we're working in the browsers that support the attribute. And we can use a JavaScript library, lazy sizes, to help facilitate the development. We can use the WebP format to enable better compression of the images. And sometimes we can use progressive JPEG to make the loading transition smoother. Sometimes browsers can have limited concurrent connections per domain. If your page exceeds the number of images that can be concurrently downloaded from a given domain, you'll see delays in the rendering of those images. One workaround for this issue is to create more subdomains, thereby increasing the number of connections. Still, this approach requires a connection to download the images. How about eliminating the connection altogether? You can do so by embedding the image in the HTML using base64 encoding, which is supported by most modern browsers. Next, I'd like to quickly mention some key points about Infinite Scroll. It is worth its own video, so here I'm just going to touch upon some important aspect. Infinite Scroll is a good match with the cursor-based pagination, and the implementation usually includes using an intersection observer that monitors the top node and the bottom node. So you have these two nodes at the top of the page and at the bottom of the page. Once these nodes move past certain parts of the screen, it triggers the callback you specified in the intersection observer. What are the benefits of using cursor-based pagination? You can find in this article, but mostly the cursor-based pagination supports real-time data capabilities. It does not skip data. It does not produce duplicated data and it handles big data sets very efficiently. The disadvantages are that it has limited sort feature support and cursor could be a bit hard to implement. In the end, I'd like to talk about some edge cases Let's say there are some network issue and the image loading doesn't succeed in the first time. When this happens, we could try implementing some smart retry logic so we can refetch the image again. Or we could suddenly ignore the arrow after loading certain times with a sensible default. That's about it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope the content is useful for you. You can use this as a starting point to explore more from here. Please consider giving me a like and subscribe if you haven't. Comment below about what you think of this video and let me know if I have missed anything. See you next time.